Okay, so this is, as I pointed out, uh, we're following a, a quarter study on evangelism. It involves personal evangelism. So here's how the quarter lines out regarding the, the topic of evangelism. So it's, I call it simply Evangelism 101. So number one, it is the answer to the church's task, and that's where we are today. We'll be in Matthew chapter 9 in just a moment, and then we'll be also in John chapter 4. Then we have, number two, the compulsion to personal evangelism. That is that we are compelled to, and here's the compelling reasons for personal evangelism. And so we'll think about that in a few moments, or, or rather next week. And then we have the New Testament pattern. There is a pattern in the New Testament that we need to follow. And so we, we're going to look at that New Testament pattern. Then we talk about number four, how people are one to Christ. There are examples in the Old Testament, of uh, which I'm thinking that are good illustrative points about uh, spurring us on to be more personal evangelist and more interested in souls that are about us. And so we'll look at those passages as we track along the way. One of them would be in 2 Kings 6 and 7 is one of them. Also simply the, the labor that was put upon the prophets. Uh, all of that, of course, plays into personal evangelism. So then we'll look at the educational preparation uh, what we need to do to prepare for it. There, are, there is preparation that needs to be done. And then we talk about personality requirements. Okay, well, right here, people. So let's, uh, but, well, let's don't get in a box and say, here's my personality, and that's not, that's, that's, not, that's not really the way we need to go about it. Here's my personality. Uh, that's not my deal. You know what? Personal evangelism has become so simple, so simple as handing someone a tract putting a tract in an envelope as you send something off. Very, very simple. So it's not about personal confrontation, and we need to kind of avoid the confrontational things if we can. Personality requirements, four types of calls. There are calls to evangelism. We have different calls to it. We'll talk about that. Then uh, lesson eight, let's launch out. Let's go out and let's practice. And then we have seven steps of an interview. That's kind of interesting. Seven steps of an interview. How are, they, how are those steps lined out and what is involved in personal interviews with people? Then number 10, probably everyone has had special situations, haven't they? Well, that's, oh boy, that's, a, that's kind of a tough one and that's, I don't know how to deal with this one. Uh, but, I, you know, I'm going to say this, that it's, it's good for us to, to face those things because as you, as you face them and, and work through some of those issues, then you do have uh, some growth. Okay, I know how to handle that next time, but sometimes if we just kind of stay back in our shell, church building, then we don't, we're, not able to, we're not able to grow in that regard. So that will be the special situations. Then excuses and how to deal with excuses. I wonder if uh, you ever see people giving excuses. Now here's what uh, we did in Earl, Arkansas, where I was preaching. I'll just give you this, just a little tidbit here. You might think, wow, that is a little, that's pretty, that's too much. Maybe. I don't know. I said, you know, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's see the people who are not attending worship. Let's put a list out and then let's make a call every single week and find out why they're not here. And let's put the reason down on a piece of paper, put it in the foyer. <laughs> well, you know, that's right. I say, okay, so if there are providential reasons, we say that, say that, that is, I can't come, I'm sick, I'm tending to someone else, I have to work on Sunday mornings, all those kind of things, that's, that's what I would say legitimate, wouldn't you? I guess I, I'm going to say it's legitimate. I'm going, to, I'm going to say you're going to be nodding with me. Yeah, that's legit. But if you say, well, I slept in, well, well, now wait a minute, we got something else. Or, you know, I was out too late Saturday night having a good time. Well, <laughs> People not are kind of like Dave that's punching De Betsy right now, uh, but so we put those things on the paper, and people, of course, uh, they're reluctant to talk about some of those things. But you know what? It did put people on the spot just a little bit. But I'm not suggesting we start that. But at any rate, uh, that's just, that's what we did in Earl for a while, and uh, it, it worked out all right. But some people are like, oh, I've got I have to be accountable a little bit, and and it's going to be published. And it's like, oh, so anyway. All right, so excuses, how to deal with them. 
and leading a person to a decision, that to me is, I think, one of the most challenging things about it, leading to that decision to become a Christian. And then finally, we'll talk about continuing from here. All right, any thoughts about the outline of how we're going to go about our business this quarter? Anything that that I've mentioned here and said, well, I don't know about that, Bill. I don't know about that listing business. <laughs> if you have somewhat to say, I'm happy to hear you on it. So, all right, comment. Go ahead. This is the heart of hearing section, see, Lisa. <laughs> that's, that's, why I, that's why I kind of stay over here a lot, some, because I'm in the heart of hearing section. That, yeah, that's right. Tracks do work. They do. And we have, that's one reason I have, tracked racks filled in the foyer because there are a lot of different tracks on different topics and they're that, that just is an opportunity for you I've, I've noticed some of the members grabbing several different topics it's help help us to learn but it's also something to give to someone else here's I would I wonder if you consider this and that's of course we're jumping way ahead of the game here but it's very very simple but the tract I think is very very powerful and something easy to do all right any other comments on the outline of what we've commented here? Cindy? Oh, your hands, are, she's kind of rubbing her hands up high like, okay, hands are cold, all right. Just don't have cold feet, that's the only thing we, okay, here we go. So let's look at the number one lesson and that is the answer to the church's task. So number one, there is a labor problem in the church. What is that problem? How do we identify that labor problem? The problem of labor in the church is that too many people suppose that the labor in the church is the worship, and that's just getting to the assembly. That's the labor. Not so. That is not the labor for Christians, is it? This is really a time to teach one another, encourage one another with the songs, hymns, spiritual songs, Pray in concert to, with, with one another to God. Uh, memorialize the Lord's Supper. But this is to go out later this week and to be energized to do what we're going to do later. And that's where people, of course, stubbed our toes. And that is we're not laboring as we should, whether it be in personal Bible studies or in making contacts. Everybody can make contacts. But so there's a labor problem. So let's look at Matthew chapter 9. Now, I told you about the passages. We'll look at two or three others as well. Matthew chapter 9, verses 23 and following. We'll go to, after this to John chapter 4. That's not on the screen. This is, of course, a famous passage. The, uh, 9, 9 and 35. I'm sorry, 9 and 35. So someone read that out, if you will, if you have that right there. Is that a prayer that we should continue to pray today? I think so. Actually, that's the, that's the primary goal of the church, following in the steps of our Lord and how he went about his business. So he went in all the synagogues, preaching the kingdom. Then he was, of course, healing. Here's a good passage that speaks about the motivating factor that our Lord had. That would be verse 36. What was his factor here? What's the motivation? Okay, without a shepherd, how does your uh, verse, uh, the first part of verse 36 read? They were without a shepherd, but that caused him to have compa compassion, compassion. Moved with compassion for the multitudes. That's pretty signal, isn't it? So we need to, I pray that I myself can be more compassionate. You know, that's, that's uh, I think that's one thing that, it's easy to lack, at least in my view, in my own soul, to lack the compassion because, okay, so we all get busy, we're always doing this and that, and the compassion is easy to go out the back door, isn't it? Because I'm just consumed in myself, my family, what I've got myself to do. But here we have compassion for the multitudes, for they were, as uh, Dan read, they were lost sheep, not ha as sheep not having a shepherd. I think that spells exactly the scene today, doesn't it? We have same thing, so we need to have compassion. So then the last thing that we noted, and the reason I mentioned it is because of what's up on the screen, and that is we have, I said it's a labor shortage, but I think uh, the translation from which uh, Dan was reading 
is a worker shortage. That's what it is, a worker instead of labor. We need workers. Pray, therefore, that the Lord of harvest send forth workers into his harvest. The harvest is ripe, but the laborers or the workers are very, very few. And here's something else to think about. Even in the church, the laborers are very few in the church. You think about, uh, th think, for example, about the finances of a congregation. The finances of a congregation, plainly speaking, are usually carried by about 15 to 20 percent of the members. Basically, right? Isn't that, isn't that correct? I mean, the, the bulk of the finances is carried by other, the monetary responsibility, bulk of it is carried by very few people. And it's the same thing regarding evangelism and uh, involvement with people, and that is there are very few that are really involved. If you come down to it, you have maybe, some have, some have even said, down to 10%. I've heard some preachers say, you know, you only have about 10%. <laughs> that are really actually doing that kind of work. And if, he, and if we look at our own selves, this is not simply to indict the church, but it is to point out that we do have a labor problem, a labor shortage in the church. And we need to think about what is our labor, what it should be. So on that same note, let's go to John chapter four. This is not on the screen, but it is involving the Samaritan woman. You might recall uh, the Samaritan woman and our Lord came to Samaria, which was a surprise and a shock to the disciples, especially because they had gone away and they were uh, going to get something to eat. And he, they came back and they found him discussing things pertaining to the kingdom with a woman of Samaria. Now, what was, <clears throat> what was wrong about that in their view? What was very odd? Number one, despising Samaritans. Okay, so they were in Samaria to begin with. So that was itself, that was itself really stretching, stretching their blanket. <laughs> and that, is, that was very tough for them. So, all right, talking to a Samaritan, number one. Number two, a woman. You don't talk to women in public. So the idea is the same as a Muslim country today. In a Muslim country, husband comes out of his house, the woman's going to come. She doesn't come beside him. She's behind him. She's wearing a veil. And she doesn't go talk to men. Now, if, she, if, they, if men talk to her, she takes the veil down, chats with men, what happens to her? They beat her. They beat her. Some of those are on, sadly, some of those videos are on uh, YouTube. You know, they just, and sometimes do worse than that. So this is the, it's not quite to that extent where they'd stone someone, who, but you just, that, was not, that was not politic to speak to a woman publicly. And so this is very, very different. Our Lord passing through Samaria, speaking to the woman. They came back, and so they did ask the question regarding that. But uh, this is, um, so let's see, this is, we'll pick up uh, verse 27 of John 4. Upon this, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was speaking with that woman. <laughs> and yet no man said, you know, what are you doing? Or what, what seekest thou? Or, why are you talking to her? They, did, they were afraid to say anything to, her, to him about that. So the woman left her water pot, went away to the city, and, he said, and, said, and she said to the people, come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Can this be the Christ? So they went out from the city and were coming to him. In the meanwhile, the disciples prayed him, saying, Rabbi, eat. He said, I have meat to eat that you know not. What does that mean? He has some sustenance here, right? He has some sustenance, and it's more important than food. That tells us a little bit about his evangelistic fervor. The disciples, they thought, has anybody brought him something to eat? That is why we're not here. Has anybody brought him a a loaf of bread, something? So verse 34, Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me to accomplish his work. Is that our meat? Should that be our food? It should be. It should be our food to accomplish his work. But his work in this text is referring to his personal contact with a woman. And so he said, now verse 35, Say not ye there yet four months, and then comes the harvest. I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that are white already unto harvest. He that reaps receives wages and gathers fruit unto eternal life, and he that sows and that he that sows and he that reaps 
may rejoice together. So herein is the saying, through one man sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that wherein you have not labored, others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. So let's pick up the last thought about that. Number one, of course, the same thought as we had in Matthew 9, the, the fields are white, that is, they're ripe unto harvest, and we pray that the Lord sends forth laborers, ourselves going, and praying that we might have more laborers or workers in the harvest. But he tells us here something interesting, and that is, when a laborer enters into the field to work, you're not necessarily doing, do, taking it from beginning to end. You're entering into someone else's field. Someone else has laid the seed, put the seed in the ground, and perhaps you're simply at this time, you're simply there at, pro, at an opportune time, a providential time to bring forth the harvest. On the other hand, other people, you might be having to simply plant the seed. But all of us work together, and it may be that people before us who have gone many years before us have planted the seed, or the situation in their life has planted seeds, and they're ready to listen. Whatever it be the case, we're not doing all of the work, and of course, we, it's, the Lord's, it's the Lord's bounty, but we all work together, whether we're simply planting the seed or whether we're bringing forth harvest. So that tells us that our evangelism involves more than simply, okay, are we going to get them in the tub? That's, that's not the deal, in the baptistry. That's, it's more than that. It's about planting seeds. It's about planting seeds. And that's the important thing here. Now, in this case, the seeds have been planted, and so now she was ready to listen, and so now she goes and gets other people. And we have a great harvest that happened right there in Samaria. Watch what happens in the next few verses. This is verse 39. And from that city, many of the Samaritans believed on him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all things that ever I did. So when the Samaritans came unto him, they besought him to abide with him, and he bowed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said, Now we believe, not because of, to the woman, not because of your speaking only, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So he stayed there, and the point simply, overarching point, is that it was a personal work that our Lord was involved with the people there. It's not going to be done unless we're involved personally. All right, so think about on the other end of the spectrum how the Jews behaved, which was the opposite of personal evangelism. How the Jews behaved. I have Matthew 21, 43 up on the, on the text. You can look at that. But what, just summarizing, how, how did the Jewish people, particularly the le Jewish leadership, how did they feel about their Judaism or Jewishness? How did they feel about that? Self-righteous, prideful, right, had to be born there. So the, the word Pharisee means separated one. Are Christians to be separated from the world? Yes, yes we are. Pharisees said they were separated ones, but their separation was not separating from practices of the world. They ended up separating from the people of the world and held themselves aloof from everyone else. And so they had a privileged position. That's what I have on the screen. It was, they had a privilege. And it's a privilege, and so they had all these uh, all these. Uh, Ways that you had to become a Pharisee, that you had, to, you had to qualify, the qualifying measures that you had to meet to become a Pharisee. And so they were separated. And so when they came into the marketplace, for example, a Pharisee would come in there and the, the crowds would have to part because they don't want to touch those robes. If you touch the robe, then what? Unclean until the even. That's, that's completely opposite of what we really needed to be. The Jews were separated by God in order that they might maintain the law of God, but they were to be at the same time evangelistic. But that's not how the Jews took it. They took it as a privileged position. Now, what, what lesson are we drawing here? Uh-oh. We better not be the same way. We don't want to have a disposition of being privileged 
and therefore other people have to, have to kind of see us as a privileged people. There are, there are privileges in Christ, but we don't want to have that air of being privileged with other people. And our Lord certainly didn't carry that, did he? He was right there in Samaria with the people. So we need to be, have that mindset. That's the very opposite of what the Pharisees had. So they felt very privileged. So let's think about, number two, the definition of evangelism. What is the definition? We have, we have really, in my view, we have uh, destroyed, or at least um, we've hamstrung, hocked the idea of what is, what is an evangelist. And the reason is because we've used it as a title for whom? The preacher, the evangelist, the evangelist. That really has nothing to do with what the New Testament teaches regarding evangelism. Who are the evangelists? You are. I am. We all are. Why? By virtue of the fact that we are Christians. We are all evangelists. It's not a privileged position, and it's certainly not a title, and it's certainly not an office. It is Everyone is an evangelist. What titles did they wear in the New Testament? What titles? And that's not really a title, is it? There's no title. That's not a title. We're not titled. And title means entitled. We're not entitled. We're, we don't have a title. The preacher has not. I just said the preacher. But we don't have. There's not really not a. There's no title for someone who is in a position as, as being a preacher. There are, there are elders, that is a position, but we learn from 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, it's a, it's a position of servitude. It's not a title, and so we we've drift into this idea of a privileged position and even using the word evangelist to refer to this position. I'll give you an illustration regarding an eldership. I was told very recently by a preacher in Oklahoma City, uh, and he was telling me that the, how the elders uh, treated him, and I thought, so they, they told him, okay, we want, here's how much you're going to preach, here's how long you're going to preach, here's how many minutes, and here's what you're not going to do as far as preach. What, what, what's the problem immediately? They think of themselves, and we think of elders too frequently as CEOs of the business. No. No, that's not, that's not what an elder is, a CEO of a business. He's not the chief executive officer and ordering people around. That's not the idea at all. The idea is servitude. It's leadership also, and there's a title of an elder or a bishop, and I'll say that, there's that, but it means referring to those who are shepherding, and it refers to the work, shepherding. So it's a work. It's not, a, it's not an office. And so we get into a lot of officialdom too many times, don't we? So I'm on the radio program, for example, with uh, Jesse Lee Peterson once a month. He's in California, but he calls himself reverend. I have never, I've never said that. I've never, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do that. And I told him, matter of fact, uh, when he came here, I don't know, four or five years ago, six or seven years ago, and mom was with me at that time, and she gave him a track. She says, she says, now, why do, you call your, why do you call yourself a reverend? And, she, and he was like, well, uh, that's, you know, my That's right. <laughs> Revere. That's right. That means to be revered. Yeah. Yeah, he came back, and the next time she said, you're not still calling yourself reverend, are you? <laughs> But that's kind of, that's, we, we all kind of like that. We kind of like positions, we like titles, and that really is the opposite of it. So we've done the same thing with evangelist. Evangelism or evangelist is not a title, it's, a, it's an occupation, and the occupation shared by all. So people ask, well, what do you want to call yourself? I just say, I'm the, the preacher, uh, but we all preach, so it's kind of hard for me to put it that way even, but I'm the preacher of a congregation stand up, and we, I teach publicly, but that's, you know, that's, that's all there is. I don't have a title. It's a, it's a service, actually, is what it is. Yes, sir. Right. 
Featured speaker, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. What about, let's take the word minister. All right. Let's, well, let's just look at a passage that uses the word ministry. Let's think about that. Let's, see Ephes let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. I'm glad you brought that up. Yep, right, same thing. Yep, I know. Now, in this context, Ephesians 4, it's talking about inspired places, positions, inspired positions. So we need to keep that in mind. But he gave some, this is verse 11, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of ministry. So there are evangelists and there are also teachers, prophets, ministers for the sake of ministering. And so we have that down here in verse, let's see. Um, let's see, I thought ministry was in here. 12, yeah, there it is. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints unto the work of ministering. What is the work of ministering? All, all of it, work of service. So you might have, I don't know if you, what a modern translation has there, verse 12, work of ministering is really work of service, isn't it? Does your Bible have, read that way? Work of service? So there's, we're all serving, we're all servants, right? Is that what, what translation you have there? New American? Yeah. So, uh, so it uses the word service, yeah. So that's what it is. It's minister is simply servant. We're all servants, so, so there's not the same thing regarding any word that you might imagine, except for, of course, the office of an elder. So that's one of the problems with evangelism, and that's one of our, I think maybe one of our hang-ups, and we think, well, okay, that's the minister's job. It's really all of our jobs. So what is the what is one of the problems? I, this is kind of an interesting point, and that is, <clears throat> it used to be in America that the church or the churches in a community were the focal point of all social activity. That was it. In early America, the churches were the center point of all social activity. People came out, okay? so. For example, if you read in the restoration movement of the great preachers, they would just simply announce Walter Scott, for example, went into the Western Reserve of Ohio, and he would go to the schoolyard, and he would, and he would tell the kids, he would say, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. Hear, he said, let's do the five-finger thing. Hear, and I want you to memorize that. So they all met, the kids at school memorized that. You couldn't, you couldn't begin to do that today in public school, but that's what they did. So he said, now I want you to tell your parents that someone tonight is going to be in the local community hall preaching those five things. Do you think he had a great turnout? Everybody in town. Everybody in town came out because that's the focal point. That's the focal point of all social activity. And so in those days, you invited people to church, so to speak, and people would come because, okay, I want to hear. But now it is different, isn't it? Now it's different. We, this is not the focal point of activity socially for the community. It might be, and I, I, it is for me and my family, the church here is the focal point of our, of our activity socially because they, you all are my best friends, and that's how I, I am about it. That's how I feel about it. And so anything that involves the church, we're involved in it, but that's not normally how the community views it, is it? So that being the case, it used to be say, will you, will you come worship with me? That would be a very simple way to evangelize because people, and then the preachers would have a lot of first principle sermons and that's how it would go. But today that's not the case. We, today we can't even get our own members to come, hardly. Right? If we have everybody attending worship services that are on the rolls, well, we'd have to open up the wings, wouldn't we? Sure, just about. So that's very, very challenging. So it's a completely different world. And so that's one of the problems, and that is 
that it's not the social point or focal point of social activity where people just come to church. They may come, and there may be some, but that's one, one area. Another problem with it is this, that if you think about this, what is the purpose of our worship assembly and the lessons that are given? What is the purpose of the lessons, gen generally speaking, generically? How we, what is the purpose of the sermon material, biblically speaking? Yes, ma'am. All right, let's let's just all right, let's just think about that for a moment. Is anybody in here not baptized in Christ? How many people in the worship assembly are not baptized in Christ, would you say, percentage wise? Say again. Just the kids. So let's cut the kids out of the equation for a moment. Take the children out. How many adults in the worship assembly are not baptized into Christ? Maybe. Maybe a visitor here or there. 99.99% of the time, we're already baptized into Christ. So I'm going to ask this. In the worship assembly and in the sermon material, what should be the, what should be the driving what are we trying to get accomplished here? To baptize you? Right, it's teaching. Edifying means teaching, building up. Edifying the church, teaching the church. Now here's where we have, in, in my view, we've gone just a little bit astray. And that is, and I, too, I try to put, you know, what a person needs to do to become a Christian at the end of sermons because people are not necessarily knowing and there might be someone here who does not know. But for the most part, we're all baptized into Christ. So I, my goal in preaching is not, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get Dan to come forward and be baptized. Well, no. The goal and what we have in the New Testament worship assembly, as outlined in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, is to edify and build up and teach material, biblical material that we might be built up in Christ. And that's the point. That's the, the very point of it. So what has happened? Well, since we have in the past, years ago, the church assembly was the focal point of social activity, it was a lot easier to preach the first principles, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized in the assembly, and there were a lot of people who needed it. But today, and really that, that really is not I mean, that, that was a cultural thing, but in my view, the main purpose of the worship assembly and the teaching is to edify, as Bruce said, edify, build up by teaching the Word of God and having a clear understanding of the text. That's our goal. So that means that if we say, okay, someone come to church and come in here and worship with us, well, they're not necessarily going to know what to do to become a Christian, except maybe a tagline at, at the end of a sermon. Or it may be, a, I, do a, I try to do first principles uh, maybe once a year, maybe a series on first principles involving how we can please God, what we need to do to become a Christian, and, and kind of revisit the first principles again. But for the most part, that's not what's going on here, is it? No. So what does that mean? That means evangelism has to take place with you out there. Here is for us. That makes sense? So that's, in, in, at least in my estimation, one of the problems that we've had is, to, is really to, to make the worship service what it needs to be here. And too many times we have focused upon only first principles when 99.99% .99 of the people in here are already baptized into Christ, already understand that's essential to salvation. Already know what it means to believe, repent, confess. Bad, already know all that. They've already done it. They've done that 40 years ago. Now what? That's, that's, what, we, that's what we've really fallen down, in my, in my personal view. All right. Comments. Yes, ma'am. Right. Yes. 
Yeah, building up. And that word is edify, building up. That's right. So in 1 Corinthians 14, he uses the word edify over and over again. Now, the whole point of this, since we're in Evangelism 101, is to recognize what the assembly is about. And that means the onus of responsibility of bringing souls to Christ is out there, not in here. That's where it's to be done. Well, who's to do it? All of us are to be involved in that, aren't we? And it can be as, as small as just, as we've talked about earlier, just handing someone a track, just putting a, putting a note somewhere. It can be as small as that. But that's, that's where the work is done. Here we're simply edifying, building up the body of Christ. And that's, that's what we're to be doing. And worshiping God. Okay, any other thoughts? Any, any more thoughts? Yes, ma'am. On the internet. Yeah. So that may be the case. And, I, and I don't, I'm not to argue that point. The internet is the place where people are going to find out the truth on certain issues. But, and we do publish ours. I publish is not even the right word, see. Uh, okay, well, there, see, okay. On the internet, the sermons and the, and the material that we have here. And I've seen a lot. But even though that be the case, the purpose of the worship assembly is to edify one another and to teach us ourselves and build one another up in the holy faith. That's the purpose. So what we're doing is we're having a window into our worship service through the cameras. That's great. But the purpose here is not to preach to those who are lost. That's not the primary purpose of the worship assembly. So that being the case, the only thing that we need to finish up with here, and I had several more things, too, is, and that is the responsibility is yours and mine to take it out there and touch base with people outside. That's the only thing I want us to really think about now because we started off saying the church has a labor problem, and that's, that's the problem. We're not laboring outside for Christ. Not enough. Now, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of areas we can labor, and, but we're not doing enough labor in that particular area. And so sometimes we think, well, okay, uh, the worship service is published out there, or the people I've asked them to come to church. That's, that's really not what we're talking about when we talk about evangelism. All right, anything that we need to say as we conclude? We have already gone over time here. So <clears throat> I'll just very quickly point out, you know, personal event, personal, and I emphasize personal, that means what? You one-on-one -on -one with somebody. That's what it means. Uh, so I, have, I had a friend at work last year when I was teaching, and uh, I would just, I, would, I gave him tracts. I said, you know, he would study his Bible. I said, Tim, I said, I, I want you to just think about this. And he took that tract, he read it. He said, I can't argue with that. I says, all right, so I'm asking you if the Baptist church is teaching that. He says, no. I said, well, all right, what? That's going to be rough. Well, it was kind of tough. I mean, he, but he's still over there because, you know, that's locked in with family and a lot of things like that. So, but he said, I see the point. I see what you're saying. So, well, what are we going to do about that? So, but that's where it was left. And so, um, at any rate, that's, that's where the evangelism has to take place. And so, think about that. And then finally, of course, uh, the, who are the personal evangelists? You and me. And then finally, training is desirable. So I do want to think about training, not that I'm the perfect uh, train, trainer, but we'll all train one another, and you can help me too. Because I know Bruce has been at it for many, many years, as well as uh, others in this congregation as well. And you, probably the, you ladies probably have been involved in a lot of it. I know some of you are looking at, and I know th that you've been involved in it. So we need to train one another, help each other out in this, in this training. Anything to mention as we conclude? Yes, sir, Brother Dan. That is a good point. Those are good uh, thoughts, really, on some of the uh, disjoining that takes place. I, I use the word, and you said attitude. I use the word intention. We have to have the proper intention to worship. Have to, that we, I intend to worship. I can be in here, and I can sing, but if I don't intend to sing to God, if my intention is not there, that's correct. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, we probably need to talk about some internet uh, thoughts about 
generally thinking about the internet and what we can do to use that. So those will be in future class. I'm glad you brought that up and Sherry brought it up too also about the internet. So, all right, anything else? Yes, ma'am. We're good. Well, listen, thank you for your participation. We've gone over about five or six, seven minutes here.